Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Money Matters event. We are so glad that you are joining us this evening for what we think is going to be a really fun time together, uh, talking to you about credit scores. What are they? How can you understand them? We are going to be covering all of that and more in tonight's event. But first, while we give everyone some time to get settled in and join the event, I'm going to go over some housekeeping tips for us to have a successful event together tonight. So first of all, please be aware that you have the option and ability to rename your Zoom profile so that it shows us your first and last name, as well as your pronouns. So if you only have a single name on your account right now, or maybe it's a fun screen name from a prior hangout you were having with friends or family, we do ask for you to please go ahead and rename your profile so that it shows us your first and last name, as well, as well as any pronouns you'd like for us to be mindful about so that we can grant you proper attendance credit where it is due. If we see lucky as a screen name, but that's not the name you used to sign up for today's event, then it's hard for us to give you that attendance credit. So go ahead and please um, complete that for us. Uh, in order to rename your Zoom profile, it's super easy. All that you need to go do is just go down to the bottom of your Zoom toolbar, click those three little dots that say more. Um, you're going to find your name on the participants list. Um, click on that participants list and then um, just click your name from the list and you'll see the option to rename your profile. Another easy way to do it is just to hover your mouse over your webcam, even if you don't have it turned on, but your little Zoom tile. There's going to be three little dots in the top corner, and that is another way that you can rename your Zoom profile. Second is please know that we are recording tonight's presentation for educational and promotional purposes so that we can show future students what they can look forward to when they attend a Money Matters event, but also so that um, those who were not able to join us live are still able to watch, listen, and learn from tonight's recording. If closed captions would be helpful for you, please know that they are being provided by a live scribe. So in order to enable those captions, all that you need to do is just go down to the bottom of your Zoom toolbar. Again, click on those three little dots that say more and select the option to show subtitles. And then they will be available for you to view throughout tonight's events. Now, um, we will ask you to please keep all microphones muted unless you are the one who is specifically and intentionally talking. We get it. Things happen. All of a sudden, the dog starts barking in the background or someone in your household starts using that really loud ice machine. You can't control any of that. But what you can control is that mute button. So in order to help make sure that we can all hear the speaker easily, please make sure that you stay muted. Uh, but we promise you that we will get your questions answered throughout tonight's event. At any point in time, you are welcome and able to communicate to us through Zoom chats. And we will be answering those questions throughout the evening or fielding them to save till the end. And then also later on towards the latter half of our presentation, we'll have an opportunity for you to come off mic, ask your questions, and participate in some activities. Now we want tonight's event to be a fun space where you get your questions answered, but we also want it to be a safe space. So we ask you to please keep all conversation respectful, civil, and clean. Also, there's going to be a few different opportunities for you to win prizes throughout tonight's event, which I will talk about shortly. Um, but also, um, there will be a way for you to receive a certificate of completion. And so the way that you'll be able to get that certificate of completion is by completing our feedback survey, which you see on the screen through a tiny URL link. And we will share that link with you again by the end of uh, tonight's presentation so that you can give us your feedback and we can then give you that certificate of completion. Some instructors ask for that in order to grant extra credits. Um, and also, it's just really nice to add to your co-curricular transcripts to show the well-rounded student that you are at Pima Community College. 
Now I mentioned that there's going to also be opportunities for prizes. And so if you would like it a chance to win a Pima prize bundle, which includes a, a planner for the current academic year, um, a pen and a water bottle, uh, then what we need you to do is follow us on our social media accounts. And there is a entry for each account that you follow. So since this event is co-hosted by the First Year Experience Program and the Office of Financial Aid and Scholarships, then we're going to be asking you to follow those two profiles. So you can follow First Year. Um, the handle is at Pima FYE, and we are on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And you can then also follow at Pima.FinancialAid dot scholarships on Instagram. And we will uh, select the winner at random and announce them by the end of tonight's event. And if you are one of the lucky winners, then we will mail you your prizes. Now, possibly the biggest incentive and prize of all is the opportunity to win a $250 tuition award. So if you attend all three Money Matters events that we are hosting this fall semester, then you are entered in a drawing to win that tuition award, which can be used and applied towards fall 2021 or spring 2022 tuition balances at Pima Community College. Now, uh, the three Money Matters events, we just had one last September. There's this one, which is the second one, and then our third one in November. So if you're on a roll, keep going. You need to attend all three to be eligible for that prize, but we're really excited to see who the lucky drawing winner is for that. Now tonight's event was planned by a lot of incredible people and we want to introduce you to them. So first I'm gonna have Tony introduce himself and his colleagues from Financial Aid and Scholarships. Hi, my name is Antonio Garcia. Um, I go by Tony, so just call me Tony. And I'm with the Financial Aid and Scholarship Office. Uh, my director, which is my boss, is Carla Gonzalez. She wasn't able to join us today, but uh, she'll be here for our next one. And Juanita is my coworker. Um, also with the Office of Financial Aid and Scholarships. Thank you, Renee. Thank you. And for those of you who I have not yet met, I am Renee Forsythe. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I lead the First Year Experience Program at Pima. And um, Pima partners with 1AZ to bring you these Money Matters events. And so I'm going to have our fabulous uh, co-host from 1AZ introduce himself. How's everyone doing today? Um, my name is Patrick Munga, and my pronouns are he, him, and his, and I'm the Southern Region uh, Workplace Banking Manager at 1AZ Credit Union. And like you all, I actually went to Pima and graduated from Pima, so I'm one of the many success stories, uh, if you will, uh, with Pima. I'm happy to be here. I love that. We are so excited that Patrick is alumni because he's literally been there, done that, and walked in shoes just like yourselves. So really excited to have him um, to work together with him. So as we mentioned tonight, we are going to be talking about credit scores. What are they and how can you better understand them? So to get things started, we have a video that's going to help introduce the concept. Give me a moment while I get it queued up, and here we go. If a friend asked to borrow $100 from you, would you do it? You're probably thinking, that depends on the friend. Are they trustworthy? Have they borrowed money from me before? And if so, did they pay it back? Borrowing money is as old as civilization itself, and for a long time, it was based on personal relationships and recommendations. The only way for a lender to know whether they could trust someone to pay them back was by knowing them personally, or if someone else they already trusted vouched for them. But when credit became big business, lending companies needed a more efficient way to decide which borrowers they could trust. So in 1956, a data analytics firm called Fair, Isaac and Company started creating mathematical models that used a borrower's history to measure their risk. And in 1989, they debuted the first industry standard algorithm, the FICO score. This formula was soon adopted by the big three credit reporting bureaus, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. 
Your FICO score is a three-digit number between 300 and 850 that indicates to a lender how safe it is to lend money to you. A high score tells a lender you'll probably pay the money back on time, so they're more likely to give you a loan with good terms. A low score signifies that you might not be able to pay the money back, so if they're willing to offer you credit at all, they'll want to be compensated for the risk by charging more interest. But it's important to remember, this number doesn't represent who you are as a person, or even whether you are financially responsible. There are people with high credit scores who live paycheck to paycheck, and people with low credit scores who save like little chip your credit score only reflects your past relationship to debt. Every time you borrow or repay money, like taking out a credit card or making a student loan payment, the lender reports that activity to the credit bureau, where it goes into the math machine. But not all data is judged equally. The largest percent. All right. So that gives us a taste of what we can look forward to. And so what I'm going to now do is hand the controls over to Patrick and have him um, go into the meat and potatoes of our presentation and tell us what we need to know. Take it away, Patrick. Thank you, thank you very much. All right, I hope everyone can see just fine. Yes, we can. We're seeing the, the blue screen and there's the slide, you're good. All right, so we're gonna go over some uh, great information today. And this information is brought to you by uh, 1AZ Credit Union in partnership with Greenpath Financial uh, Wellness. So let's go in and follow here. All right, so Greenpath provides a variety of um, different services and that's including one-on-one -on -one financial um, assessments, housing counseling, um, bankruptcy counseling, and uh, uh, debt management programs as well. But for today, we're going to focus on the credit report and review. All right, so today we'll be talking about credit and why credit is important. Um, uh, well, if you look at it in a different perspective, it's one of those things where how does it affect you uh, when it comes to, you know, your everyday life, basically. So credit is very important and um, it's something that not everybody looks into on a daily basis. So we're going to go ahead and get started with the first part, which is why is credit important? So before we get started in the ins and outs of uh, credit reports and uh, the scores, it's important to take a step back and consider uh, the importance of credit in the first place. Uh, if you put it in another way, it could be, um, you know, basically landing your dream job, right? Uh, for me, being in banking, I've been in banking for well over six years. I started off with uh, uh, Citibank. So that's my that's my dream is to be in banking. So uh, credit, of course, played a huge role at least for me because they actually pull your credit report to make sure that you know um, you're pretty much um, a good candidate in the sense. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that you know having bad credit would would mean not getting the job. It's just to make sure that you are who you say you are. And basically, most of uh, the employers that we have, uh, sixty percent of employers actually, they do uh, credit checks. Um, so uh, it's, it's important to keep note that uh, when they pull it, uh, there's a misconception that they'll have, uh, you know, the score as well, but they don't have the score. They just have the information that's on there. So um, basically, if you're applying for uh, an, uh, an industry where it has to do with credit um, or like banking, you then rest assured that, you know, credit will play a big factor. Uh, but if it's something outside, aside from financials, then it won't really um, be a, a focus in that aspect. It's just to make sure that you are you're there. Um, now, if let's say you they pull it and you owe upwards of five thousand dollars or more, then at that point they're gonna really want you to either write a, a letter of explanation uh, explaining uh, what happened and why you owe the amount, and then of course they also look for. Uh, what you're going to do to actually uh, rectify the, the situation. How are you going to pay it back? Or do you have a payment plan going on with the creditor? Or uh, what are you doing in order for them to actually give you that, uh, that job? So for instance, if you apply for um, the airport and you want to work at the airport, TSA is going to go ahead and uh, pull the credit for all prospective employees. Uh, and then of course, they would, they would be expecting that you take care of anything that's in collections before they offer you the position. Um, so good credit um, would also mean landing or getting a, a loan. Uh, I do know when I was back in college, um, there were times when I needed you know, some extra funds. 
uh, but I didn't know any anything about credit. I didn't know anything as far as where to start. Uh, even when I got out of high school, I didn't really know. So it's definitely refreshing that uh, you know we're able to share this information with you all, um, because uh, just having the the small um, insight or you know even a big insight uh, when it comes to credit is definitely going to make a huge difference when it comes to uh, getting a loan. All right, so. Um, when it comes to renting or buying uh, your own place, uh, there's also a credit check that comes into play. So you can just imagine that credit really plays a huge part in everything we do. Um, so whenever you go and you, you want to uh, get a, an apartment, they're going to run your credit. And that's going to basically determine whether or not you, you, uh, um, you're going to put down a, a huge deposit or if you don't put one at all. So that's definitely another way to look at it. Um, when you're purchasing your own home, they're going to pull your credit. And basically with that, they end up pulling all three, at least for, for a mortgage, they'll pull all three and then they'll go with the middle score uh, to see what terms you'll be getting when you get approved for it. Um, now, I'm sure all of you know, or, or, or I've heard of the um, uh, good credit, uh, no, no problem. I mean, good or bad credit, no problem. We can help, you know, such places. Uh, what do you think would happen if you got a, a loan from a place like that, right? It's usually uh, getting interest rates uh, upwards of 25% um, just for a, either a car loan or, um, um, or even just a personal loan, right? And it takes forever for you to pay that back because you're paying so much interest uh, over there as opposed to somebody who has good credit. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and look at some examples here. We do have uh, two candidates. We have um, um, Diego and Angela, uh, and all things as far as underwriting pieces are equal, and the amounts uh, as far as uh, what they're looking for. Uh, income and stability is all the same, uh, but because Diego has 660 and Angela has 750, um, you can just imagine who's going to get the most, um, you know, bang for their buck in, this, in the sense of, you know, having good credit. So in this case, we're looking at um, interest rate of 5.25, uh, for Diego and 4.63 for Angela. Um, and then the monthly payment being 1381 and uh, 1285. And then of course paid over 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 the life of the loan 30 years, uh, 496,984 and then 462,726. So when you look at it in this aspect, you might think, well, it's not really, you know, that much, but Angela actually saves uh, 34,258 over the life of the loan. Um, so I don't know about you, but I would rather have that 34,000 in my pocket and you know, either invest it so that way it works for me or you know, just put it in a safety net. You know, that's a lot of money to lose out even though it's 30 years. All right, so next one here. Uh, so basically we're gonna go ahead and uh, shift gears here a little bit and look at what's on your uh, credit uh, uh, report. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, have the first things here for TransUnion, Equifax, um, and Experian. Uh, those are the three main uh, credit bureaus that we report to, um, any lenders, if you will, um, they report to. So what is uh, on your credit report? So the first thing um, you will see on there is identifying information. Uh, that's going to be somewhere, something of your name, your social security, your date of birth, uh, your address and employer. Uh, and this information is really used for uh, any um, underwriting department, whoever is looking at your report, uh, just to make sure that you are who you say you are. So they basically utilize that information. And then the next thing will be uh, open accounts. Uh, so money that you borrow, uh, this includes uh, details uh, related to credit cards, consumer loans, auto loans, mortgages, student loans, um, and uh, any type of debt. So the report will contain information about when you open the accounts, uh, whether you pay on time, uh, your balances, uh, and then of course your credit limit. And then the other thing will be, if you're 30 days late, that's gonna show up on there as well. And then we have uh, closed accounts, um, basically collection records, um, other household billing generally will not show up. For instance, like your electric, uh, uh, whether it be your phone bill, um, those will not show up unless you stop making payments on them. And then at that point, it would be sent to a collection agency and then they can report that on your credit report and basically 
then it would show up on there and then it would be hurting your score. So that's all the collection um, records that are on there. Then the other thing would be inquiries. So whenever somebody accesses your account and, and for the purpose of um, uh, you know, offering you a loan or approving you for a loan, that's a hard inquiry. So basically they will then, uh, that will then affect your, your credit uh, score at that point. Uh, the other uh, type of inquiry is a soft inquiry, which is basically when um, either a lender accesses your, your, your credit information and basically they're just gonna look and see if they can offer you something. And it's something where you didn't actually, you didn't actually approach them, they just look and they actually do that. And that's why you end up receiving either balance transfer offers or credit card offers is because they looked at that information, but that doesn't hurt you. Uh, and then of course there's um, the aspect of you looking at your own uh, credit, uh, pulling your own credit, whether it be Credit Karma or uh, on your credit report.com that in itself will not hurt you because you're pulling it yourself as well. And then the last part would be the consumer um, statement. This is a space that uh, is uh, on your report and it's not more than hundred uh, words on there, but basically it's just a statement that puts it, that, that they put on there. Um, uh, whether it be a creditor put that on there and they just say, oh, uh, doesn't pay on time or, uh, uh, always using too much of the credit line, something of that nature, but that's on there. And the important, th the important thing about that is um, whoever is looking at your report manually, they'll be able to see that and that may determine whether or not you get a loan or you get approved or what terms you get approved uh, based off of that. All right, so now I'm sure everyone is aware uh, because every day I look at my accounts every day, making sure I know what my, what's in my debit account, you know, my checking account rather. Um, and I'm sure everybody looks at that, but what about your credit score? Like how, when, when was the last time you checked it, right? So we need to get in the habit of uh, checking it every so often. And um, you, you have um, 12 months in which to get a free credit score. So, or, or you know, report if you will, and you can check that at any time. Um, so the best place to start, of course, is annualcreditreport.com. Um, and this website is not um, uh, sanctioned or anything like that. It's basically, uh, it came about because of the Fair um, Credit Reporting Act. And that just basically says that every 12 months you are uh, entitled to actually receive a score, um, not a score, but rather a report for free. So you can go to annualcreditreport.com and then request it there. Now you can either request it online or you can either uh, send them a, a, a letter or requesting it. And then you can also give them a call as well. So that way, you know, they'll be able to get all that information to you. So it's important to be in the know and be aware of where your credit is. Um, so let's say for instance, you anticipate uh, making a large purchase later on down the road. Uh, we always recommend that, you know, six months prior to actually applying for it, you pull your report and you know you see exactly what's on there. So that way you know exactly where you stand. And if there are any errors, you have more than enough time to uh, take care of what that issue is. So that way you can uh, then get favorable uh, terms uh, when you get either approved uh, or to make sure that you do get approved. So when you go to annualcreditreport.com, you will see a screen such as this one. Um, and please note that only the report is, uh, is, uh, is free. So you can actually pay for the score itself. And it's usually about $6 to $8 per credit bureau. Um, and then of course there was a law in place that, that states that um, if let's just say a, a lender approves you for less than the, the uh, terms that are favorable, they're supposed to give you, um, uh, you know, the, the score and the report as to what they used to actually approve you for those terms. And if they denied you, they need to do the same thing to make sure that they explain why they denied it, right? So you're definitely entitled to getting that information. Right. Now, you do have an option uh, to get all three uh, reports at the same time. Uh, if, you, if you've never seen your report, uh, you can actually get um, your report staggered to where you get it either all at the same time or you pretty much get it each quarter. Uh, so basically staggered reports would be um, you get a report from like, let's say for example, from uh, May, you get Equifax and September, you get TransUnion. And then in January, 
you get um, experience. But then you'd be eligible again to uh, in May to of the following year to get uh, anchor tax again. And by doing it that way, it just allows you to to see your score or to know where your score is every you know three times out of the year. So then that way, if there's any fraud, you're able to capture or catch that fraud and actually take care of it right away, as opposed to if you didn't know and it's just there and then it's not taken care of. All right, so when you review your credit report, you will most likely um, notice some accounts that no longer you no longer have, uh, maybe uh, an old car loan or you know it could be a credit card that was closed out. Either way, but you know, there's certain ter terms as far as how long everything is going to be on there. Um, so for extended period of time. So most negative items uh, will stay on your credit report for seven years. And then by the way, um, uh, it's, uh, yeah, so it'll stay on there for seven years and then basically it'll fall off. And that's seven years from the date of your last uh, uh, activity, if you will. Because uh, there's also a misconception there that if it's sold to a um, to a collection agency, that that starts all over, but that's not the case. So it's basically seven years from your last uh, activity, and then it falls off. If it doesn't fall off, then you do have a uh, an option to dispute uh, what's on there because that's an error, and then it should be taken off. But we'll look into that here in just a minute. Uh, so as you can see. Uh, there's inquiries, which will be on there for two years, and then we have um, late payments, student loan uh, defaults, foreclosures, uh, Chapter 13 bankruptcy, uh, all those stay on there for seven years. And then Chapter 7 bankruptcy stays on your report for 10 years. Um, chapter 13 bankruptcy, uh, which is a court-approved uh, payment plan, will stay on there for uh, seven years after the plan is finished, or you know you're done paying off, or ten years, whichever it comes first. Now, the good news: the good news is that uh, the information such as on-time payments or credit card and uh, mortgages can stay on your credit report uh, forever, you know, indefinitely, which is a good thing. So, having more than um, you know, good information uh, helps, having more information rather uh, helps uh, strengthen your credit score and the history. So that way it kind of increases that score all the time. Um, so uh, the important thing is to make sure that everything is accurate. And that's why we're saying, you know, make sure you, you pull your report every so often to make sure that you're, you know, everything is accurate on there. But you'd be surprised about 10 to 20% of uh, the population has a uh, they have significant errors on their credit report. And that's why we have those businesses such as credit repair businesses out there. And that's why they stay in business because of that stat. Um, but keep in mind, everything that they do is something that you can do on your own. It's not something you need to pay for. All right, so if when you're reviewing your credit report, you, you spot uh, uh, an, an error, you can then go ahead and dispute it. You can do that by sending um, a dispute via online, or you can either give them a call or send it uh, via mail. Uh, but make sure you set you know you send copies, keep records, and document everything. So then that way you know you you have a claim and, and the basis of that. So that's basically how you dispute that. And then let's just say that credit bureau uh, the the, uh, the credit bureau. Uh, they go ahead and review everything and then they they find that you have the most accurate information then at that point it's going to be uh, deleted uh, but if let's just say it turns out that they sided with the creditor then at that point you, you still have an option you still have a, a way to dispute um, or, or escalate if you will uh, the and file a complaint with the uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, you can either do it online, which is the best way of doing it, or you can give them a call. And that's also another way to pretty much uh, continue that dispute. All right, so uh, you may be wondering why we've been talking about the importance of monitoring and making sure uh, the information is correct uh, on your credit report. This is why. So basically, we have a scale here uh, from 580 uh, or less being poor all the way up to eight, 800 plus uh, being um, the greatest of you know, good, good score. So the, 
the three digit number reflects the, the, the credit risk and the likelihood of repayment. And then of course, um, uh, the lower, it means just the likelihood of that, you know, the, the creditor will not be paid or they won't get their money back. But the FICO score is the most widely used score model. And basically uh, that's what determines whether or not you get good odds of uh, good favorable terms when it comes to loans, car loans or home loans. Um, and this is the scale that they use. All right, so there are of course uh, factors as far as uh, how your uh, credit score is broken down. Uh, and then we're gonna go ahead and take a look at these factors here. So we have 35%, which is the payment history. Um, so this is the largest portion, and this is one that uh, we can all pretty much control in a sense. Uh, so it's just a matter of making sure that we are paying on time. As long as you pay on time, you know, you get 35% impact uh, on your credit score. Then uh, uh, we also have 30%, which is a amount owed slash use of available credit. Um, this is also uh, something that we can control by making sure that we, we're only utilizing a certain percentage. In this case, the rule of thumb being 30% utilization of all credit um, that you have available to you. So as long as you keep it within 30% or less, then of course you have a good positive outcome to your score. Then 15% uh, is gonna be the length of credit history. So the longer you have established good uh, credit history, the more trust you have held, uh, built up. So essentially if I asked each and every one of you to say, hey, let me borrow $2, <laughs> you know, you, you most likely be like, uh, no, I don't really know you. But if I built, you know, that history over time where, you know, I have the reputation of paying on time with interest, um, then at that point, you're more inclined to lend me money, right? So it's the same thing here. Then we have 10%, uh, which is the types of uh, credit use of credit mix. So you want to make sure you have at least, you know, a credit card, uh, personal loan, uh, car loan, um, and, you know, maybe even the mortgage. You know, if you have all four, you know, have that mix, that definitely helps you. And that's only 10% of your score. And then new credit, uh, the impact on that one is 10% as well. Uh, but keep in mind, uh, applying for too much new credit can actually indicate that uh, you don't really have a plan for that money and that you're probably just living off of your credit, which is a red flag. So it's very important that you limit how many times you're applying for new credit. Now, uh, you can definitely utilize some resources out there. Credit Karma is one of those resources um, that you can utilize in the sense of just keeping a gauge on where your score is. Uh, keep in mind, this one is going to be TransUnion uh, and Equifax only, um, but it gives you a gauge. So usually from what I've, uh, I've learned, you know, from my own personal experience, uh, if I see that it's saying, you know, 750, it's probably around maybe 725. It's not always as accurate, but it's definitely some uh, tool you can use to just gauge and um, at least be, on, you know, in the know, if you will. Um, so let's see here. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and look at another example here. Um, so let's go ahead and apply what we've talked about thus far. Uh, so for example, we're going to look at Diego and Angela again. Uh, and then in this purpose, they only uh, have uh, one credit card. At least Diego spends $800 on his uh, credit card each month uh, and, hits, um, and his limit is $1,000. Um, each month he pays it off as soon as his bill comes through. And then Angela, on the other hand, carries a balance of 5,000, which is the balance. And then of course, uh, limit is 10,000, uh, but she only pays the minimum, right? So uh, in this case, I'd ask, you know, who do you think has the better credit score, right? One would think, well, maybe Diego or Angela, I'm not sure which one you guys, you guys would say, but it's actually Angela. Um, Angela would have a better uh, credit score. And the reason being is because uh, she's only using 50% uh, ratio of her $10,000 limit, whereas Diego is using 90% of his limit. Um, and that's really where the red flag is for a creditor, is that you're utilizing uh, a little bit too much of your credit. Now, Diego is still in a better position in the sense that next month, he can just opt to use less than what he has as far as his credit limit. And basically at that point, it would be, it would be a positive impact and he should see his score go up uh, without a problem. 
Angela, on the other hand, uh, may may be hurting in a sense because she's only able to pay uh, $25 minimum, if you will, and it will take her a little bit longer to pay that off. And basically, since she's that much closer to her score, I um, mean, her limit, the creditor may actually lower her credit score, uh, not credit score, but her uh, limit, and that can actually hurt her in the sense to where it gets even closer to a, you know 100% utilization. And I've actually seen this happen um, where, you know, when I was with City, people would call in and be like, hey, why did my, uh, my uh, credit limit, uh, uh, you know, drop? You know, why did you, you know, uh, uh, lessen my, my, my limit in a sense? And it, that hurt them. So then their score went down because of that. So it's definitely something you need to be um, aware of. All right, so, but it, what if you have, um, you don't have any credit? So we really have to go ahead and look into how you can uh, build slash rebuild your credit. Uh, so before focusing on building credit, you, you first want to uh, uh, review your goals, right? Uh, you wanna look at um, whether you're, um, uh, uh, whether you're financially stable or if you have any uh, savings in your savings account uh, before you go into getting a credit card or, or getting anything like that, because then you'll be going into debt. And if you don't have a, the means of getting out, uh, then it can be a, a problem. Let's see. So you want to make sure you're financially stable. All right. So a few ways you can build your credit. Uh, you can either go uh, and get a credit card. Um, and then making sure that you're using it, um, you know, uh, you're using it to where you're not using too much of your credit uh, limit, and you make sure you use it and keep it around the 30 percentile range. Um, and then, of course, the best part about it is before you actually go getting a, a credit card, uh, for those of you who don't have any, um, go with a secured credit card first, you know, learn how to utilize that, make sure you build those habits that you know, help you, uh, you know, raise your score. So then that way, once you know that you can handle it and you're doing well, then you can go ahead and uh, apply for an unsecured credit card at that point. Um, so yeah, as far as the secured credit card, that's basically what we spoke about there. Now, there are some institutions where you can go in and, you know, you give them $300 and then they give you uh, a credit limit based off of that $300 and that's the secured card. Um, and then, of course, you just utilize it the same way you would um, any other credit card. Uh, if you're late, they'll assess your late fee. Uh, and then if you have a running balance, they'll assess you some finance charges there. So nothing changes. It's still the same. It's just a matter of uh, if you default or, you know, you don't pay, then you know they, the creditor can then go ahead and use that three hundred dollars to pay it off, and you're you're all set, and there's no problem there. And then the other part is secured loans. Um, so the secured loan would be something that you know one AZ offers is a sense of you you give them you know three hundred dollars, and then they put that in a shared secured um, account, and that um, account would then pay you know whether you transfer it over to a checking account certain amounts of payments, whether it be 12 months or six months, and then you have $25 or so going into that account and making those funds available as you go along. So that's really how that secured loan uh, works. So then at that point, it's reporting those payments for you and you're building your credit at that point. And then of course, there's retail and gas cards. Um, these are a lot easier to, to get. Uh, you can, uh, I'm pretty sure a lot of you have gone to like, you know, Macy's or uh, Dillard's or any other establishment and they're offering you that credit card. That's basically what that is. Uh, and it's a lot easier to get. The only problem with that is they, they have pretty high interest rates, upwards of 20%. So it's very important that you do uh, pay it off uh, whenever you, you charge on it. Um, the other thing too is make sure that you don't um, go to any any um, stores that you like because then you'd be tempted to run that card up. So I wouldn't go to Macy's because I actually like Macy's. So I wouldn't go there and get that card. Now, the other alternative would be getting a co-signer. Let's just say you want to uh, get a car, note, uh, car loan rather uh, and your credit is not that great. You can have either a family member or a friend who's willing to co-sign for you. And then, um, and then you know, you'd be able to get that car. But keep in mind that both parties are 
responsible for that uh, debt. So you, you might want to be ready to jeopardize that relationship if, if, uh, if somebody stops paying there and messes up your credit. So uh, that's something to keep in mind. The other thing, this is one that I actually really like, which is being added as an authorized user. Uh, the good thing about this is you do not, um, you're not re um, liable for the debt that, uh, that is accrued on that card. Um, but the only thing is that the good will show up on your, on your report as well as the bad. So if you're gonna be added to somebody's uh, credit card, make sure it's somebody that uses it responsibly. All right. Um, now we got some tips here on using credit wisely. Um, so basically, uh, we're gonna go over some of these tips. Uh, the first one, of course, would be savings. Uh, so you need to have some money in your savings uh, as a backup to make sure that you, uh, you know, you're able to handle any unexpected uh, expenses without getting into uh, debt using credit or credit cards, if you will. The other one would be. Uh, consider making only one charge on the card. So if you have more than one uh, credit card, uh, make sure that you charge uh, just one uh, charge on there per month. Uh, so then that way your utilization is not um, max, maxed out, if you will. So then that's gonna help your, your score as well. So keeping it within the 30% or less, that's gonna help your FICO score. And then, um, of course, using one third of available credit, that's essentially what we just went over. And then of course, the lower the utilization, the better. And it shows that you're, you know, you're savvy, you're, you're credit savvy, you know exactly what you're doing. So they're more inclined to trust you and, and offer you even more credit. So I've seen it to where, you know, they'll reduce the credit limit and then they can also increase the credit limit even without you asking for it. But you can also go ahead and call them up and say, hey, I've been doing everything well. My limit is is not as high as I want it to be. Can you please increase it? And more 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 times than that, they'll actually go ahead and increase it for you. All right, and then pay the uh, the balance uh, to avoid finance charges. Uh, so essentially, when you pay off the full balance, there's a misconception that you know uh, it's going to help your score. Not necessarily. It's just so you can avoid uh, the finance charges. So what really helps is just making the payment and, and having that activity. So even if you were to have a credit card and charge, you know, $2 on there, as long as you have activity every so often, that's, that's a good thing. Now, um, if you have a credit card and you don't use it at all, and I've seen, I've seen where people have a credit card and they're like, oh, I don't want to use it. I leave it at home. You know, sometimes if it goes long enough, they'll actually uh, close that card and you don't want that to happen. All right. So yeah, and then of course, as we mentioned, going over and checking your credit score regularly, that does not uh, hurt you at all. And that's another misconception. So you wanna make sure that you check it so that way you're in the know and then you can avoid any fraud that may happen um, as we go along here. All right, so there's a lot of uh, misinformation out there uh, when it comes to credit. Um, uh, credit scores, and then of course, reviewing your credit and you know the myths. So we're gonna go over and uh, talk about some of those. So the first one here is um, uh, something we all hear, uh, closing a credit card will hurt my credit score. Uh, this is more like half myth um, because uh, it depends on the situation, right? It depends on the person's situation. So we're gonna go ahead and take a look at an example here. Uh, so in Sarah's case, she has three uh, maxed out credit cards. Uh, so since she's using 100% of available credit, the utilization portion uh, of her score will suffer. And then um, uh, if she pays off the first card, uh, so then at that point, her available uh, credit will increase. But then if she decides to close it, in this case, then again, that means that you know the utilization goes back up to 100%, and that's what hurts you. So it's not so much closing the card, it's really just, you know, if she closed one that was still, you know, maxed out, she still has that available that's there for her. So it's really helping her in that sense. But if she closes the one she paid off, then of course it would hurt her. And then uh, for Katie, um, she has no utilization in the sense. So if she closed, uh, uh, you know, one of the cards or all of the cards, in that case, it's not really hurting her because there's little to no uh, 
utilization there. So it would be negative uh, impact for Sarah and then Katie would be uh, little to no impact. And then myth number two, checking my credit score will hurt my credit score. And again, we, we, we did state that, you know, it's not gonna hurt you if you're pulling it yourself, just so you're aware of where you are, that's something that's a good thing. We encourage that, you know, cause especially right now with everything going on, there's a lot of fraud going on. So it's important now more than ever to check your score and, you know, your, your report to make sure that there's nothing on there that is, uh, you know, fraudulent or, um, any errors on there, so that way you can take care of it. All right, so so checking it every so often by yourself is not going to hurt you, and then of course it's a soft inquiry, so it doesn't really hurt anything. All right, um, so we talked about quite a lot of few things uh, regarding uh, credit. Uh, so now it's just a matter of uh, going out there and actually. Uh, implementing what we learned uh, by going to annualcreditreport.com and uh, pulling your own uh, report now, now that you know that it's not going to hurt you. Uh, and of course, the information that we have here was brought to you by Green Path Financial uh, Services with 1AZ Credit Union. And uh, my name is Patrick Munger again. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And I'll go ahead and open it up for some questions here. Great, thank you so much. I know that Tony's been collecting some questions from chat. So Tony, we'll let you MC and field those. Yes, so we do have several questions, Patrick. Um, so you were talking about uh, your lower credit score or the higher your interest rates and monthly payments. Is that always true? What was the question again? So the lower your credit score, that means the higher your interest rates is gonna be monthly payments, right? Is that always true? Yes, yes. So because again, the, the scale in itself is basically the it's like an inverse. So the lower your credit score, the higher interest you'll pay. And then the higher the credit score, the lower interest you'll pay. So you get favorable terms at that point. Okay. And we also had a question about um, it's Sam Levitt's question. Mm -hmm. So again, so when you ask Sam Levitt for a flex payment, they do an inquiry on your bank account. For example, mm -hmm. is that a hard or is that a soft? That's a hard inquiry because they're actually um, pulling it to extend credit to you, right? So it is a hard inquiry. So anytime a lender uh, pulls your report in, in, uh, in, in the hopes that they'll go ahead and extend credit to you, it's always a hard inquiry. The only time it's not is, let's say, for instance, you go to a bank and you want to open up a checking account, they will do a credit pool but that's not to extend the credit to you. It's just to make sure that you are who you say you are, right? So that's the difference there. Okay, and there is a question on inquiries. Um, can you go over the, the inquiries just a little bit more, um, like mainly the difference between a hard and a soft um, yeah. inquiries? So let's say 1AZ, you come to me and, and you want uh, a credit card, right? Um, we sit down and I say, okay, we could go ahead and give you this, that, and the other. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get your information. Um, give me your social, this, that, and the other. I put it in the system. I pull it up and I pull your report in order to give you a credit card. That, that's going to be a hard inquiry. Um, now, if we're just opening up a checking account and I say, I'm going to go ahead and uh, run a, a report just to you know, make sure that you are who you say you are, then of course, at that point, it's not going to affect you in any way, shape, or form because we're just checking to see that you are your identity. So it's just the identifying information that we're going to look at, not so much what's on that report. And that limit on that credit card, does that affect um, your score at all? The limit on the credit card? Correct. No, it's just the utilization that's going to affect you. So if you have a $1,000 credit limit and you use you know 90% of that, that's going to hurt you. Now, if you use less... You know, and of course, the ideal being 30% of that, then at that point, it shows that you're not living off of your credit. You know, you're just using it as a tool. But, you know, that's what it is, really, it's just a tool. Um, so there's no red flag if you're using it less than what is, you know, given to you. Okay. And there, there was a question about that 30%. Mm -hmm. um, so using it above the 30%, does that affect the, your credit score at that time? 
it's not so much the score, but it will affect um, whether or not you get any increases going forward or uh, if, if, um, if they're going to decrease it, that can affect it in that aspect. And then when it does, let's just say they decrease it, then at that point, your utilization goes up, right? Uh, if they increase it on that, on the other hand, then it helps you in a sense because you're using less. So they kind of see it, see it as a, not so much as a red flag. They look at you as, oh, okay, this person knows what they're doing. So we can trust that we can add more and they'll be able to utilize it in that case. Um, Okay. So there was a question that came in the chat as we're talking about the percentage. Mm -hmm. So if somebody's using their credit card at 90%, but they're making monthly payments, is that going to ne negatively affect my score? If, what was the question again? So if I'm using my credit card at 90%, mm -hmm. is that neg negatively going to affect my credit score? Not but I'm making score. monthly payments. Actually, the question was they're paying everything in full monthly. Okay. Okay. So, and, and that's the thing. So if you pay, if you pay them full monthly, um, there's two things that you gotta, you gotta look at. Uh, and, uh, and I do know that was a colleague in here that I worked with before. Uh, so basically she would know what I'm talking about. You have to think about two, there's two dates, two most important dates. Those days, the due date. So when you pay it off in full by the due date, it, the only thing that's going to help is just the payment itself. You paid on time. That's it. If you pay in full, that does not, that has no merit as far as to, you know, your scoring itself. It's just that um, the, the institution itself will see that as a red flag if you use too much of it. So think about it this way. If you have the due date being the, the 10th, right? And then the closing statement date for a credit card, uh, we just say is the 15th, right? So you don't have enough funds at that point. You just have enough to pay the minimum due which is great. So you pay the minimum due, you pay it on time, that affects you in a positive way, right? Now, you're, you're using 90% of your credit limit. If you come to the, the closing statement date and you pay it off in full, the only thing you're doing to pay it off in full is to avoid interest charges. That's all it is. And then you have to pay your, your statement balance in full for two consecutive billing cycles in order to avoid those interest charges. Because there's people that will call and be like, wait a minute, I paid last month in full. Why am I seeing interest again? It's because it compounds daily. So when you do pay it off in full, the snapshot of that statement is just basically where you were at that time. So you pay it off twice you know, in full. So paying in full does not really do anything for your score. It's just to avoid interest charges. Let's put it that there's a lot of questions about credit cards. So uh, <laughs> another question is I've heard it is better to only pay minimum instead of the whole amount so that you always have a balance on your card, but without the interest. So, and that's the thing. So that, that, that's, that's a myth as well, because you, the only thing that's helping you is the payment. That's all. So whether you pay the minimum or you pay anything in between, or you paid in full has no merit to your score. It's just the payment that ha that actually affects your score because it's 35% of uh, your score. So it's, it's a very uh, large number there. Okay. Um, as, I'm sorry, I'm also trying to pull the questions that are coming in mm -hmm. as I'm trying to read you, the ones that are already on here. But um, okay. I have a hard, very hard credit, perfect payments, five years history, a couple of accounts, and I'm having a hard time getting an excellent. Any advice to push the needle? Uh, that all depends. So, so uh, again, they have good good credit, mm -hmm. but they're but they're trying to get to that excellent point. Okay. So, what's the credit mix, and how yeah. long have you had um, those accounts as well? So, the credit mix is definitely something that has to do with. Um, you know, helping you in that in that way. So if let's just say you don't have any personal loans on there, you can go for the secured loan and it'll do the same thing as if you, you got a loan, but you know, this is money that you already have secured. So uh, it's just the mix that you need to incorporate. If you have a credit card, you know, you know get, it, get yourself a secured loan, you add that in there. And if you have a car note, that's in there. So the credit mix is really what's gonna help you. And then the positive um, payment history the longer you go, you know, as you as you keep adding to it, is also going to help you. That's really what's going to help you. So it sounds more like time. You just have to give it more time. Uh, that's really what's going to help you in the long run. 
Um, and again, just for clarification, is it better for your score to be spend at 30 or 50% on your limit? 30% so what is a good limit to have on, on your? Yeah. So 30% or less. 30 or less. Have, okay. Yeah. So if you have, let's say $5,000, I don't, I don't suggest going and spending 30%, but you know, uh, Keep it keep it low in the sense that if you have let's just say you have five credit cards, put one you know uh, phone bill on there, and then the other one you put your electric on there or or something else on there, something small, you know, to keep that thirty percent range, uh, and that's what's going to help. So the rule of thumb is thirty percent or less. That's really what's going to help. Okay, can you explain a secured credit account compared to others? So secured credit uh, account, uh, we, I'm sure we're talking credit card here, is essentially you, you um, um, now one is it doesn't offer the secured cards, but other institutions do. Uh, so all you have to do is essentially go to that institution and let them know, hey, uh, what I'm trying to do is build my credit. So I need to have a secured card. And they'll tell you what the minimum is. It's usually either $200 or $300 or somewhere along the, the you know, that range. You give them that $300, they put it in the account, and then they'll give you a credit card at that point. That's going to basically, um, that's what you then use uh, as your, you know, your credit card and just put one, one bill on there and don't max it out, use 30% of it. So then that way you can build your credit. And that's basically the difference with uh, an unsecured card, which is basically, you know, you don't give anything up front. They just approve you based off of your, um, your credit score at that point all your credit worthiness if you will okay mm -hmm. how long does it take to build up a good credit so there's not so much as how long it's really just um we're talking about good history right uh so basically your payment history if you if you let's just say you opened up your account today uh and you're using it the right way you're keeping it within 30 percent and you're making payments on time within six month time frame, you can actually see a positive uh, outcome from it. So that's basically what you wanna do. And then of course, you also wanna limit how many times you, you uh, apply for credit. Uh, so basically, if you do it within a span of two weeks and you apply for, for you know maybe one or two or three of them, and you either get approved for those, then you kind of hold off on, on applying for new credit and then you use them uh, you know, accordingly. So that way you can build that positive um, credit history. Okay, and there is a question about moving into either an apartment or a housing development where they pull the credit. Mm -hmm. How how does that affect your credit score? So that's not going to affect your credit score because again, they're not extending any credit to you. They're just using it to see that uh, you are who you say you are. So like, if I go and apply, and, you know, they're going to go ahead and say, okay, we're going to run your credit to make sure you are who you say you are. And then it also determines whether or not you're going to have to put down a deposit and how much of the deposit you will be putting down. And that all comes with um, your, your uh, credit history and your credit score as well. So once they pull that and you have good credit, then you may not even have to put down anything. But if, uh, if your credit is challenged, then of course, at that point, you know, you may have to put down maybe even uh, one month's rent uh, for some for some institutions. Okay, and there's a question about mortgage. Um, so if I get a down mortgage payment for a for sale or lease on a house, what will the mortgage loan do to my credit score? I'm sorry, repeat that one more time. So again, they're they're saying they're putting down for a house or a loan for a house mm -hmm. uh, that's for sale. And now they got a mortgage. How will that affect their, their credit score having that loan or that mortgage loan on their on their credit? Oh, yeah. So essentially, basically, just uh, again, it's just more of uh, your payment history. So if you're paying on time on that mortgage, then, of course, that's going to be reported. And that's to all three credit bureaus. Um, and then, of course, as far as the down payment itself, uh, if I understand correctly, that just depends on whether or not you're going to have PMI, which is the uh, interest uh, that comes with it. Uh, so to avoid it, if you put down 20%, I believe, then at that point, you can avoid PMI. Um, but other than that, having that mortgage, the impact is, of course, your score will go down a little bit, but then it will come right back up. 
uh, because they actually put it in the uh, extended, you know, that long to you for the home. Well, well, thank you, Patrick. I think that's all the the time we have for for quick Q and A with Patrick. We will have a little more time at the end, but we want to make sure that we go through our our, our program. So, thank you. Oh, so, sounds I good. Think, uh, You're welcome. Yeah. I think the activity might also help even generate some more questions or maybe even answer some of the questions or be a way to practice and mm -hmm. apply them. So um, I know that some of you all have asked me um, and said that you had to leave early for class. So um, we do have about 30 more minutes left for the program. Um, and we're going to um, also still have some time for more Q&A at the end. And we will announce our winners at that time. If you have not yet followed us on social media, there is still time to do so. And again, we will announce those winners um, in about 30 minutes. Um, and so, but what we're going to do now is give you a chance to practice what you've just learned and heard from Patrick. So we're going to be doing an activity where we are going to enable some poll questions and you're going to get a chance to vote on whether you think it is a myth or a fact. So let's go ahead and get started. So first question is, uh, you should check your credit report from each of the three main credit bureaus at least once per year by requesting copies from annualcreditreport.com. So Tony is going to open up the poll question and we want you all to vote on whether you think this is a myth or a fact. We'll give you all about 30 seconds. So yes, it's, it's true, and no, it's it's not. It's a myth. Fair enough. <laughs> yes, it's true. Yes, it is true. Wait, what was it? Yes, it's a fact. No, it's a myth. Correct. Right. All right. <laughs> Correct. All right. It looks like most folks have voted. So it looks like 87% um, uh, said that that is fact and 13% voted that it is a myth. So drum roll please for the final answer. It is indeed a fact. And so we've got a brief video here to help illustrate that point a little bit more. Back. So when you pull a credit report, you're gonna to wanna to pull all three and you're gonna to wanna to set them side by side and you're gonna to wanna to go in through an inventory, all three of them, because information is going to be similar and redundant, but the likelihood of it being identical is very, very rare, or likelihood is very, very low and it is very rare that you actually see three credit reports that are entirely redundant. You may not have the same accounts on all three credit reports. You may not have the same inquiries on all three credit reports. One account may update at a different time of the month than, an, than it does with another bureau. And so even though the account shows up on all three, doesn't mean that it updates at the same time at all three. And so it's very likely that your credit reports are gonna be different. So I would not just pull, for example, your TransUnion credit report and then just walk away thinking, hey, oh, the information was correct. I'm good to go. Well, that's like locking one of the three doors in your house. You have no clue what's on these credit reports, Equifax and Experian. So take the time to do a full inventory of information across all three of the credit reports that, that, that are really important in today's credit environment and have been for decades. Equifax has been in business in one form or another since the 1800s. So just to give you an idea of just how old they are. All right, um, and uh, I forgot to mention that this activity follows along with the PDF handouts that we shared with you in your confirmation email. There's both an English and a Spanish version, so you're welcome to follow along either through those handouts um, or uh, through the Zoom poll. Either way, we wanted to make sure that this activity was accessible for everyone, and Tony has also shared those links with you to the PDF um, in Zoom chat. Patrick, is there anything else that you would add regarding this myth versus fact? Um, no, at least with this one here, just, yeah, making sure you're pulling it over so often. Um, 
you know, especially right now, you know, with everything going on, <laughs> you want to make sure you know exactly what's on there. Because I know we all work on the, you know, debit side of things. We always want to check out our, you know, savings, check out checking. We should take the same initiative with the credit as well, because, you know, that's really what drives everything we, we do on a daily basis as well. Excellent point. All right. So question number two So when two you pull a credit is... report going to be as long as you do not have any debt, you will have a high credit score. So do you think this is a myth or a fact? So again, yes, yes means fact, no means myth. We'll give you all a few seconds here to cast your vote. And see what the majority of the group says. So far, everyone is in agreeing. Most folks are agreeing that it's a no, but we've got a few folks who are countering the point and thinking maybe it's true, maybe it's a fact. All right, so it looks like um, we have 16% who thought it was a fact and 84% who thought it was a myth. So survey says that it is indeed a myth. All right, so let's watch another video to see the point illustrated. You have an outstanding debt. Your creditor offers you a payment plan. It's for less than what you owe. You're tempted to take the offer, but could settling a debt for less hurt your credit score? Before we go into the answer, it's important to note that for best credit scoring results, you want to pay off everything you have on time or at the very least as soon as possible. If you can't, settling the debt for less could affect your credit score, but it could also do some damage control because if you don't settle the debt, you can't guarantee that it won't go to judgment or get sold to a debt collector. If you do decide to accept a settlement, make sure you get written confirmation from the creditor of the terms. You can also ask the creditor if they'll consider not reporting the settlement to the credit bureaus to ensure your credit score stays intact. Before you make your decision, assess these risks and decide what's best for you. All right, Patrick, anything you'd add for that? Yeah, so I mean, uh credit is essentially debt so if you don't have any you don't have anything to report <laughs> so in that aspect you know it's um, you know you definitely have to uh, have credit in order to have a, a score or a report um, so as far as the video yes you definitely want to make sure you hit it head on so if the creditor calls you beforehand uh, you, you know they want to offer you a settlement you want to make sure you take that so that way it's taken care of before it goes to a debt collector and it shows up on your credit report at that point and then it starts hurting your score so um yeah so you definitely want to make sure you take care of it right away awesome all right here comes the next poll question it is question number three the only way to improve your credit score is to pay off your entire balance every month. So Tony's going to open up that poll question. Let's have you all vote and see what you think. All right, it looks like we have 33% uh, who said they think this is a fact and 67% who think it is a myth. So final answer is that this is a myth. All right, now our next video as a caveat is rooted from the UK, but Patrick assures me the information is just as relevant for us and enjoy the accent at the same time. So here we go. Hi, I'm Simon from the Customer Relations team. Credit scores are calculated using the information found on your credit report. There are dozens of factors that affect your credit score, some more than others. Here are our top five tips for improving your score. Number one, keep your balances low. 
The lower your overall balance is, the better, not counting your mortgage. If you can afford to pay off a bit more debt and you want to improve your score, it won't do you any harm to reduce account balances across your credit cards, store cards and overdraft. Number two, stay well within your credit limit. If you have a credit card or an overdraft, you'll have a limit over which you're not allowed to spend. If lenders see that you're sailing close to these limits, they may have some concerns about your current financial circumstances. Your Experian credit score looks at your balances set against your limits and calculates the percentage of available credit you're using. The higher that figure, the lower your score. Number three, limit your credit applications. Lenders get spooked if they see you're making loads of applications. What you might consider innocent shopping around can be interpreted as desperation for credit or even identity fraud. Try limiting applications to less than three in any six month period. Number four, get yourself registered to vote. Not only is it a legal requirement, it will boost your credit score too. Lenders are rightly very concerned about checking the identity of their new customers and they'll be looking for your name on the electoral roll to help them do this. Check out the Electoral Commission's website aboutmyvote.co.uk for how to register. Number five, set up direct debit payments on your credit accounts. Late payments will have a big impact on your credit score and if those late payments stack up into more serious arrears, the damage can be financially crippling. Setting up direct debit payments will ensure an excellent account payment history, a significant factor in gaining a high experience credit score. All right, Patrick, anything you wanna add for that? Yeah, so I mean, essentially what it said is, you know, you know, one thing you wanna do is keep your limit low. Uh, which is good, making make, making your payments on time. Uh, that is also uh, the best way to go about improving your score. Um, however, paying it off in full does not really have any merit on your score at all. Uh, it's basically, it's not part of the factor or the algorithm, if you will. Um, the only thing I can say is that if you're going to uh, use it and, and max it out, if you will, make sure you know when the statement closes so that way you can at least pay it off in full so that way it reports you know, the zero balance at that point. And then after it closes, you can go ahead and use it again. Um, but keep in mind that it still shows a red flag to the creditor themselves in the sense that you're using too much of the, of the limit. So that can kind of hurt you in a sense, but paying it off in full does not have any merit to the score at all. Good to know. And again, if any of these poll questions are sparking any new questions for you all, please throw them down in chat. And um, after we go through this activity, we'll have a little bit more time for questions at the end. But first, Hi, let's go discuss thing. our fourth act, um, poll question, which is, if you pay off your entire credit card balance in full every month, you will hurt your score. You must carry some balance from month to month. Do you think this is a myth or a fact? Cast your votes. All right, so 31% of you voted that it is fact, and 69% voted that it is a myth. So let's see what the answer is. It is a myth. There's no fooling you all. It's because your PIMA students, you all are so smart. All right, so let's watch this video to hear why it is indeed a myth. This is financial advisor Patrick Monroe talking about how paying a credit card off in full each month will affect your credit. This is one of the best strategies that an individual can use to keep their credit score at a high basis. Make sure that you use your credit card in a timely fashion and that you're mindful that you do not take on charges that you cannot pay uh, over time. It's great that you would pay off your credit card balances as they come in every month and bring your card balance back down to zero. 
that uh, really trumpets to the credit card reporting agencies that you are a uh, responsible uh, debtor and uh, that you should therefore be given a higher credit score going forward. Sometimes people will not be able to do that. Uh, however, they should make a payment that is more than the minimum payment to send a message to the credit card company that you are managing your credit in a positive way. However, paying your credit card balance off on a monthly basis in full is the ultimate way uh, to make sure that you have the highest credit score available. This is financial advisor Patrick Monroe. Another Patrick. I love it. Patrick's are smart in the financial game. Patrick, anything you want to add? Yeah, so essentially, you know, paying off in full, you know, it, it's not part of the score itself. It, it just definitely sends a positive uh, outlook on you to the credit bureaus. Uh, you know, it just shows that, yes, you, you're managing it well, you, you know, credit savvy, you know what you're doing. So at that point, you know, there's no need to lower your score, if you will. So that's really all that is. Uh, the only thing is, all you need, honestly, is to generate activity, right? So you have a credit card, you go to the store, you buy some gum, and then once it's built to you, paid off, that's it. It doesn't matter how much, per se, you're just looking for that activity. All right, let's do one more poll question. Um, this is financial advisor Patrick Munro. All right. You can eliminate negative parts of your credit score by closing accounts that are overdue. Myth or fact? So Tony's going to open up that poll for us. And we will give you all some time to vote. All right, so 36% of you voted that it is fact, and 64% voted that it is a myth. So the answer to this question is that it is indeed a myth. Let's take a listen to see why. Closing credit accounts, will that increase my credit scores? True or false? And the answer is... False. Closing credit accounts may seem like a way to boost your scores, but it can actually hurt your credit. A credit score is partially determined on how you handle the debt. So if that account or accounts are closed, then it's going to be hard to generate a score, especially generate a score you're going to be happy with. Something else to keep in mind is that the length of your credit history is a key factor in your credit score. You also want to make sure that you're using your credit cards because if you go too long without any new transactions, the credit card company can close the account on you due to inactivity. Thank you for watching. I'm Rob the Credit Guy. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button so that way you can get all the facts on how credit really works and you can educate yourself to get yourself one step further. All right. So Patrick, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, so like my man, man Rob said, you know, <laughs> uh, closing it is not really going to, uh, you know, help you in any way because you want to have that credit mix. Uh, and then, of course, again, if you think about it this way, if you have two cards, one's maxed out and then you pay off one of them, right? And so now your, your utilization goes down because you're not at 100% anymore. But if you close the one that you paid off thinking that, oh, I don't want to be tempted, you know, then you're back to 100%, so that's gonna hurt you. Now, if you have two cards that are both paid off and you close them out, that won't really hurt you per se because there's, there's little to no utilization there. However, you'd be losing out on the history that you have there as far as um, the credit card history and then of course the credit mix as well because you wanna have all that in place as well in order to generate a good score. Good stuff. All right. Well, I know that we had a few more questions that came in through chat. So we have about five minutes to those so that we still have five minutes at the end to announce our winners and do the final survey. Um, so, Tony, I'll hand the mic back over to you so you can MC those questions. 
Thank you, Renee. So, Patrick, you ready? Ready. All, All right. <laughs> All right. So, does it sound like a good idea to choose a credit card account, but pay the account to the point of no payments Closing left? credit accounts. Will that increase oh. my credit scores? True <laughs> or false? And the answer is... Oh. Rob, the credit guy, don't want to... <laughs> <laughs> Rob wanted to answer it. Sorry, y'all. Right. It's my turn, Rob. Come on. <laughs> All right. Um, mm. So, do you want, let me go over it again. Okay. Does it sound like a good idea to close a credit card account, but pay the account to a point of no payments left, opening a second one to use it as a fresh product? I mean, closing it out and, and you paid off to no payments, then at that point, you don't have any uh, anything reporting. And if you open up a new one, that's just a new, another inquiry. And then, of course, that's another 10% that's going to hit your, your report because you have new, his, new, new inquiry. And then it's also taken away from the history that you've built over the years, right? So basically, that takes away. So that would hurt you in a sense. So I wouldn't recommend doing that. I'd keep it open, uh, make the payments paid off in full. Then your utilization goes back uh, down, which is a positive thing. If you open up a new one, so then now, now that way, if it's let's say five hundred dollars, and you open up another one for five hundred, now you have a thousand dollars credit limit and no utilization. That's a positive thing. Cool. So, Patrick, I know we. I, it seems like we're beating this dead horse, but people are really interested. Is it possible to spend too little of a percentage on a credit card, uh, or are we just looking at thirty percent? So there's no such thing as too little. Uh, if anything, like I said, you go to the store and you buy a piece of gum, you want that activity because at the end of the day, it'll report a payment. It was not going to report, oh, you spent $2 or you spent $3. It's not going to report that. It's just going to report the payment. And that's what you want. So you want that activity. And then, of course, like Rob, my, my main man said, you know, if you, if you don't use it, the credit uh, department or the, the creditor themselves would actually close the, 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 the card. Then you'd be calling you know, and saying, hey, why did you close my card? It's because you didn't have any utilization or, or any uh, usage for it. So they assume that you don't need it. And rather than having it open and stay open, then you're leaving it to you know, the uh, fraud, fraud stars to actually use it in that case. So it's a risk. So that's why they end up closing it. Cool, thank you. I mean, there's a lot of questions on credit cards there, Patrick, and <laughs> I think they keep they keep coming in. So yeah. one of the questions that sort of um, maybe um, it's actually a pretty good question that says, Patrick, can you maybe recommend someone, a specialist, for example, to talk more about in depth about their credit score specifically? Um, so who do you recommend? If, okay, our meeting is over. What happens to these students that have questions after? Who who do you recommend they they talk to? Yeah, so they they there's my uh, my email there, um, and then of course my phone. Uh, it's it's open. You can always you know reach out at any time, uh, and then of course uh, if you need even more in depth, I can sit down with you and we can go over it and and review what you have on your score and and help you in that aspect. And then if not, then I can always have one of my bankers sit down with you and and help you. So. 1AZ is definitely there to help you, um, you know, succeed financially. Uh, and then, of course, we also have uh, advisors that can sit down with you to help you with that as well. So you can start with me, reach out to me, and then if I have the time to go ahead and go over some stuff, we can do that for you. Yes, and I think uh, it's Renee's put it in the chat. Mm -hmm. So we got Patrick's number, we got Patrick's email. So if you guys got questions afterwards, and Patrick's your guy. He's I don't have Rob's you. contact information, but oh, we got Patrick. Oh. <laughs> yeah. we'll Patrick's you. better anyway. <laughs> He's a Pima alumni. <laughs> yeah, so reach out to Patrick, man. He's your guy. Um, okay, so let's Last go over. question. Last question, okay. Pick a good one, Tony. Okay, okay, okay. Um, again, credit limits. Um, so if I have a $300 credit card and I spend it to the limit, uh, is that bad for you? Does that affect your credit score? Not so much the score, but the institution, like, you know, the, the, the creditor will look at it as a, as a negative, uh, as a red flag, right? And that's when we end up, you know, closing, not closing it, but, you know, dropping your limit down. Uh, or, you know, if you, if you continue, they end up even closing it. Yeah, so I've seen that happen before. 
like, hey, why'd you close my card? Well, you were, you were not really using it the way we thought you would. And so you want to build that trust by not using too much, especially if it's $300, then, you know, just keep it within that 30 percentile, put one, one uh, charge on there uh, and then go from there. Cool. Well, thank you, Patrick. I think Renee uh, beat me to the punch. She already threw, mm -hmm. threw the survey out there. So if you guys can fit, please fill out the survey. Again, you're, you're going to get a, a certificate of participation and uh, we got prizes for you guys. So thank you, Renee. Yeah, absolutely. So um, again, let's also take a moment to give Patrick a virtual round of applause and show him our thanks and appreciation. We really made him work tonight, but um, we value your time and all of the experience and insight that you shared with us tonight. So thank you so very much. And you all, he means it when he says, please use him as a resource. Um, that's um, what he is here for. Um, so I want to announce our social media winners. So for those of you who followed us, on our social media accounts for the first year program, as well as the Office of Financial Aid and Scholarships. We thank you. And um, you were entered in a, a prize drawing. So congratulations to Isaac Rojas and Sabrina Garcia Smith. You are the two lucky winners this evening who have won this Pima prize bundle. So what we will do is when you fill out our feedback survey here in a moment, um, you will get Give us your contact information and the means of your A number, and then we will mail you your prizes shortly. So again, you've won a Pima student planner and the Pima water bottle as well. All right. Now, again, keep in mind that if you attend all three events this semester, then you will also be entered in a drawing uh, to win the $250 uh, uh, drawing for the tuition award. But in order for us to track your attendance, we need you to fill out our feedback survey. And so um, Tony is going to share that link with you in chat. Um, again, we thank everyone for attending uh, this event tonight. We hope that you found the information valuable. We do have one more Money Matters event coming up soon. It will be offered on November 4th, again at 4.30 p.m. Arizona time. Time. And the topic for that event will be cybersecurity and identity theft. So now that we've taught you about um, how to protect your money um, or how to manage the credit scores, we're going to be talking to you about how to protect your money and more. So also in the Zoom chat, Tony is going to share with you a link to RSVP for that event. Again, we do need those RSVPs so we can share with you the Zoom link to join. So um, when you take a few moments to complete that feedback survey, not only is it going to grant you attendance credits um, and contribute towards that ultimate drawing of the $250 tuition award, but it is also going to be our signal to send you a certificate of completion, which will be mailed to your email address that you provide from 1AZ Credit Union. Now, if you liked the information that you learned tonight, that feedback survey will also ask if you give us permission to share your contact information with 1AZ for them to reach out to you for additional purposes to see how they can help you achieve your financial goals. So that is something else that you will have the choice to opt into as well. Also, again, I wanted to make sure that we shared with you information about how to contact um, either the first year program, the Office of Financial Aid and Scholarships, or 1AZ Credit Union. Again, we are all here to support you in the multiple different ways along your Pima journey. And so please do not be shy and let us know how we can help you. Now we do have a partnership with 1AZ Credit Union. So you will see that there is a link to our partnership page with them. And this partnership page is going to just show you how, um, if you wish, you can open an account. Um, Patrick, is there anything you'd like to share about that? Yeah, um, so while you're on that page, of course, well, once you, um, if you're interested in opening up the account, there's of course that $100 that you'd be taking advantage of. Uh, and again, uh, not only that, but you also get to sit down with a financial advisor and, and ask more questions and go over goals based analysis with them, which is most valuable if you ask me. Uh, but if you go up, up to the top, uh, Renee, um, I want to go ahead and show. So you can go to 
where it says uh, business. Let me get so rid of that and then it'll show it better. Okay, business. Yeah, you go to business and then you go to workplace banking right there. Mm -hmm. And then you will see me right there, um, workplace banking again, just hover on it. Oh, hover over it, excuse me. Mm -hmm. and scroll, uh, go all the way to my name there. There you go. So when you go on there, you'll be able to uh, either email me or give me a call. And then what we'll do then at that point is uh, set a, a set a time, set some time aside for you to ask all the questions you need, and then we'll take care of it, anything that you, that you need, uh, you know, as far as your financial goals are concerned. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much what I wanted to show there. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Well, that concludes our programming for tonight's event. Again, please make sure that you fill out that feedback survey so we can grant you the attendance credit, send you your certificate of completion, enter you in the drawing for that cumulative prize of $250. And we hope to see you again at our next month's event in November. Have a great night, everyone. Take care. Keep Bye -bye. striving. <laughs> Thank you.